and our mission And our mission is to promote mental and emotional well-being through mindfulness. We founded it 2017, and it's a volunteer-run organization. We conduct free workshops for kids across the globe. And our team is very passionate about helping individuals of all ages and backgrounds to develop the skill and knowledge needed to live a mindful life. Through our online platform, we help with free mindfulness resources, tools and tips to help our community become more aware, stay connected and confident. And we strive to create a meaningful and lasting change in the lives of our members one day at a time. Today, uh, it is Vivekanand, Swami Vivekanandji's uh, birth anniversary. And we have uh, Swami Chidekanand who will be kickstarting our session. So I just wanted to let you know about Swami Chidekanand he is a monk of the Ramakrishna Order of India, uh, born in Los Angeles after receiving his BA in English and JD in law. He became one of the first Indian Americans to serve as an assistant district attorney for San Francisco under the supervision of the then senior attorney Kamala Harris, the present vice president of the United States. Here he saw firsthand how a negative mindset affects criminals and the importance of a positive mindset. In 2004, he decided to renounce and join uh, Ramakrishna order in India. He took his final vows in 2014. He regularly teaches classes on yoga and Vedant in IIT Kharagpur and likes to make them practical for a young audience. For the past nine years, he has served as production editor for journal Prabuddha Bharata at Advait Ashram. Thank you, Swamiji, for joining us today. We are really blessed to have you. And you can start by unmuting. Oh, I, I just want to add that uh, Swamiji is currently at Harvard. Um, and uh, he can uh, tell us more about uh, that. Right. Yeah. He's doing, he's studying at the Divinity, Divinity School at Harvard. Yes. Yes. I think you're he's on mute. Uh, Om Jananim Sharadam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Pada Padme Toyo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohur Namashri Yati Rajaya Vivekananda Sudaye Sachit Sukha Surupaya Swami Neta Pahine. Okay, um. Namaste, everybody. So it's nice to, uh, I didn't know it was called Mind Gym. Other, um, so that's nice. I'm, I'm glad to have the uh, privilege to kick things off. So first, uh, before question and answer session, just this uh, short talk first I wanted to focus on. And um, uh, I'm kind of basing this. I know Purnima and Prem are avid Vedantins. Is anybody else here? Are you also, anybody else here in this group? Do they like uh, follow Swami Sarva Priyananda? Like, all of you okay okay that's good so i'm purposefully now doing something a little bit different today okay, okay. and um what we're gonna do is because what does who can say what does vivekananda mean vivekananda what does that literally uh -huh. sanskrit the bliss of wisdom renunciate one who can uh, no, differentiate no. right no, yes, sir. okay ananda means bliss but what does viveka mean a discern discernment yes the bliss of discernment. So today what I've purposefully done, um, the co topic is Swami Vivekananda's unique contribution to the yamas and niyamas and its practical relevance. So um, I'll just give a broad, just very, very brief, uh, broad view of what yamas and niyamas is. And from that, I'm just going to take one of the yamas, which is ahimsa. And we're going to analyze, I've taken it, I've just pointed out uh, it's mentioned in two sutras in the uh, yoga, Padanjali Yoga Sutras. And uh, there's a short commentary there from Ved Vyasa, the main commentator of the Yoga Sutras. It's also mentioned in the Gita. And I put that there. I think Purnima might have sent out the handout, 10.5 and 13.8. So I wanted just to see what Shankara and Ramanujacharya said about it. Just the definition of Ahimsa. And in contrast, what Swami Vivekananda said about it. And I think that what I hope to show is um, 
what I really feel is that uh, in studying any of these scriptures, that I don't think we do enough justice to what Swami Vivekananda, uh, his works, he is the greatest commentator, whatever, even Vedantic scripture we're talking about, not only Swami Vivekananda, but Holy Mother and Ramakrishna, their words and their lives. You'll see, I think, by this talk and just this focus on just this one term, Ahimsa, how they, um, it's something that becomes very nuanced. And just four points I'm just going to make about what I feel the uniqueness of Swamiji's interpretation. It's a good thing if they did, right? That's Yeah. Uh, hello? Okay. Uh, four interpretation, four unique points of Swami Vivekananda's uh, yamas. Number one, he interprets them in a positive manner, not a negative manner. Number two, he, from a position of strength and expansion, you're talking about mind, mind gym. So this is uh, entirely appropriate. Uh, number three, this is something really interesting. And he talks about this in Raja Yoga, that Vedanta yoga, bhakti, these things are not just to be practiced just to, um, for the sake of one's own bliss. No, it's meant as to be manifested, manifested in life. And how does it get manifested? It gets manifested even as power, right? Power, intensity in one's character. And the fourth point is that when we look at Swamiji's uh, interpretation of Ahimsa, we'll see that he does not like extremes. He's very nuanced. And I think that that type of nuanced is really necessary today as well. I just see it even in Harvard. If we go to extremes, that's what this cancel culture and these things are. So, you know, there's one um, from the Gita, I'm sure many of you have heard. There's So how does a knower of Brahman, how does he walk? How does he think? How does he how does he talk? How does he eat? And then Shankaracharya said in his commentary to, to I think this is 2.53 of the Gita, that um Stita Braksha Lakshanam Sadhanam Upadishyate. So the that which comes naturally to a knower of Brahman, that's our spiritual sadhana. Okay, so you have this, uh, I first want to start with this um, 2.29 the uh, of the Yoga Sutras. It mentions this yama niyamas, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, ashta angani. So these are what we call the eight limbs of yoga. Okay, the first one is yama, which we're going to talk about today. Yama literally means um, universal ethical disciplines, things that we can all, from all religions, whether you're religious or not, that we should practice just for a civilized society. And so the definition is universal resolves that foster harmonious relationships to the self and to others. Niyamas are additional resolves taken by yogis and spiritual practitioners to encourage spiritual growth. Um, Asanas, posture, pranayama, regulation of breath, uh, the pratyahara, management and withdrawal of the senses. Okay, um, I'm just going to focus, today we're going to focus really on yamas, okay? And um, of the yamas in 2.30, uh, we have this, I'll just read this, the sutra first. Ahingsa, satya, asteya, brahmacharya, Aparigraha Yamaha. So let me just ask, when I say Ahingsa, what do you normally think of? Nonviolence. Okay, nonviolent. Okay. Did I put that? I didn't put that in there. Did I pray in the in the did I put that in the handout? Okay, Come on, Swami. Do you know what Ahimsa no, no, is? I know, I know. I'm, I'm just saying what I did. That's okay. No, of course you know. And that's that that's what the commentator said as well. And satya means, of course, truthfulness. Asteya, you, what does asteya mean? You, you guys know? Not. Yeah, okay. non-possessiveness or non- Not non-stealing. Okay. And brahmacharya aparigraha. And just just, just for the, just to know, socha means, the, the niyamas are socha, cleanliness, santosha, contentment, tapas, discipline, swadhyaya, study of the self, and study, study of the scriptural text. 
And Ishwara Pradhana means this uh, devotion to God. In fact, in your Advaita Vedanta, how many of you here have studied Vedanta Sada? Okay. So they have this, you know that they have in, the, in Vedanta, we talk about these four pillars, Viveka, Vairagya, Shat Shampati, Mukshutva, right? So this Shat Shampati is similar to what we're talking about in yoga. Yoga, we, we call it Yamas and Niyamas. And in Advaita Vedanta, we call it this Shat Shampati, these six treasures. In Buddhism, they call it Panchashila, the five moral codes of conduct. Pancha means five, and Shila means moral codes of conduct. Now, in Buddhism, they ask the practitioners, rather than, um, they, they say it differently. They say, rather than uh, speaking, the, speak, uh, they say avoiding violence, avoiding lying, not stealing, not engaging in sexual misconduct, not engaging in possessiveness. So you see that there's this kind of like a negative interpretation. One really interesting story about this was that Swami Vivekananda, when he was drafting the rules of the Ramakrishna Martin mission, his um, his disciple, Swami Shuddhananda, was, was uh, taking down notes. And Swamiji told Swami Shuddhananda, we want everything to be positive. Everything should be absolutely positive, no negativity. So there was something regarding tobacco. And um, I forgot what it was, but Swami Shuddhananda wrote, all monks shall take shall, shall partake in tobacco <laughs> so <laughs> so then Swamiji said not that far <laughs> so now before we go uh, to the definitions how the different uh, commentators interpreted can anyone think like what is the purpose of these yamas and niyamas what do you think the purpose of these things are as spiritual practitioners so Ramakrishna, one day, it's in the uh, Kotamrita. Uh, does anyone in here know Bengali? No. Okay, that's all. that's good. That's good. Just, just calibrating the audience. <laughs> um, so anyways, one day Ramakrishna went and he met, so you've heard of this, uh, this Balaram Bose, a great devotee of Ramakrishna. And so he was um, seeing Balaram Bose's father. And he, Balaram Bose's father engaged in, engages in lots of spiritual practice, lots of sadhana. So he's doing his japa. So Ramakrishna sees him and he asks the others uh, in the audience, why is it that some people, they do so much spiritual practice, but what takes one year, it takes them 18 months. Why is that? Um, same thing Ramakrishna used in another way that uh, the, a boat trying to get across the ocean or the river, but it has holes in it. These holes are the lackings in these yamas and niyamas. Same thing we can apply to Advaita Vedanta as well. We're doing so much of the Shravana, Manana, Nidhi, Dhyasana, but why we're not making progress. Not, not You guys are making progress, I'm sure. I'm just saying in general, right? <laughs> so, But anyways, no, any all of us actually, if we look at it. So this is the reason why. It's, it's these lacks and these yamas and niyamas, Okay. Let's now go to the next locus, 2.31. And so I've just tried to establish a little bit what the yamas and niyamas, especially the, the importance of the yamas and niyamas are. Now I just want to look at how in the Yoga Sutras, uh, just cite a couple of sutras that mention ahimsa. So 2.30, uh, we mention ahimsa satyas asteya brahmacharya aparigraha yamaha. And then... 2.31 Jati Desha Kala Samaya Samaya Anavichinna Sarvabhoma Mahavratam. Now, this is where it gets kind of controversial. This 2.31, this Mahavratam, these are the great universal vows. So, regarding Ahimsa, it has to be what? It has to be practiced in all circumstances. That's what this Sarvabhoma means, all circumstances. So Vyasa's commentary on this, he says that non-injury to animals and plants, which is not only killing, but even frightening, frightening them should be avoided by yogis. So abstinence from injury is, the not, is uh, not causing pain to any living creature at any time. 
In fact, this is interesting because this is actually our sannyasa. We take this vow as monks that um, we should not give uh, abhayam. We should give abhayam to all creatures. So not causing any kind of fear to others. Now, what's the problem with Vyasa's interpretation? So I looked at it. The problem with it is it's relational. It's dependent upon not causing fear in the other, but it doesn't go to the subjective intent. You see that? He's just not causing fear in another, but it doesn't talk about the intent. Vyasa takes it even one step further. He talks about that, um, I shall not cause injury for the sake of the gods and Brahmins or in any other way, meaning don't engage in ritual sacrifice, don't kill any animals, things like that. And he takes it even one step further. Injury caused by soldiers in the battlefield should not be allowed. Okay, so he's taking it really, really far. So when you think of this, what does this contradict? Remember the Bhagavad Gita? There's Plagbyam Mas Magamapartha Na Eta Twai Upapadyate. So remember Krishna's telling Arjuna, don't yield to unmanliness. This does not befit you. Um, give up this pettiness, this petty weakness of heart. This was this was one of Swami Vivekananda's favorite um, slokas from the Gita. Anyways, I just wanted to point out first Vyasa's commentary, which was kind of uh, kind of scant. Next one I want to point out from the Gita, Bhagavad Gita, 10.5. Ahingsa samata kushtihi tapodanam yasho yashaha bhavanti bhava bhutanam matta eva pritak vidha. Non-injury, equanimity, satisfaction, austerity, etc., these different dispositions of beings spring from me alone. So he mentions ahingsa there, non-injury. So what does Shankara say, say about this? He does, says non-injury, non-cruelty towards creatures. Ahingsa para dukkha hetutvam. Hetutvam means being the cause of, not being the cause of uh, cruelty to, towards other creatures. Ramanujacharya Raman also says the same thing. Nonviolence is avoidance of being the cause of sorrows to others. Okay, sir. That looks like Lal Chan's mother. Okay. okay. So you see, you see that, again, the problem with these commentators, I'm just quoting what they've said. So they're very relational, but they don't deal with the subjective intent. Now, just one final one from the Gita, 13.8. Amanitvam adam bhitvam ahingsa shanti arjavam. Humility, unpretentiousness, non injury, forbearance, sincerity, service of the teacher, etc. These are the qualities of a spiritual aspirant. So Shankara says here ahingsa means again non injury, absence of cruelty towards creatures. Ramanujacharya goes one step further here. He says, ahimsa is the absence of tendency to injure others by speech, mind, and body. So it includes some type of subjective intent. Now, before I get to Swamiji, I'm just going to complete Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhi. He also gave a uh, commentary to this sloka. And he said, ahimsa in its negative form means not injuring any living being, whether by body or mind. It requires deliberate self-suffering, not a deliberate injuring of the supposed wrongdoer. In its positive form, ahimsa means the largest love, the greatest charity. Okay, so again here, he's saying it requires deliberate self-suffering, okay? This was what kind of Indian society did during the Buddhistic age. And that's probably one of the reasons why uh, we were invaded by. We did not build up our military. So you can say that it's uh, overly broad. You're applying it to everybody. At most, it can be applied to sannyasins, but you're over-applying it. And you're also overextending it. So 
what does Swami Vivekananda now say about Ahimsa? So I went through his different complete works and see what he said. He, the first thing he did, he critiqued Ahimsa when it's interpreted in extremes at both the level of objective manifestation as well as subjective intent. I'll explain. So regarding, say, Buddhism, Swamiji said, the Buddhist tenet, non-killing is supreme virtue, is very good. But in trying to enforce it upon all by legislati legislation without paying any heed to the capacity capacities of the people at large, Buddhism has brought ruin upon India. So you see that? What he's done? Okay, these things are good. But what do we have to do? We have to be nuanced how we interpret these things. So when you enforce non-killing at the societal level, it weakened our military and it brought harm to India. Swamiji continues, this duty of non-injury is so to speak obligatory on us in relation to all beings. As with some, it does not simply mean the non-injuring of human beings and mercil mercilessness towards the lower animals. Nor as with some others, does it mean the protecting of cats and dogs and feeding of ants with sugar, with liberty to injure brother man in every horrible way. So this kind of reminds me, you know, sometimes uh, say some that uh, protest against abortion. So they're trying to protect the rights of the unborn baby, yet they go to, they sometimes go to places like bombing abortion clinics, right? And killing people in the process. Swamiji continues, it is remarkable that almost every good idea in this world can be carried to a disgusting extreme. A good practice carried to an extreme and worked in accordance with the letter of the law becomes a positive evil. Then he continues regarding the Jain monks. The stinking monks of certain religious sects who, who do not bathe lest the vermin on their body should be killed, never think of the discomfort and disease they bring to their fellow human beings. They do not, however, belong to the religion of the Vedas. So he's talking about the Jain monks there, right? <laughs> so what do we get from that? Do you see the difference between, I'm not picking on any of the other commentators, but do you see the nuance of Swami Vivekananda in comparison to what they did? So he's talking about not what is he saying? Applying in what we say in Bengali, Baba Harika Buddhi, practical intelligence. You mentioned one of your, um, Anisha, I think you mentioned mindfulness, mind gym, right? Even when it comes to the scriptures, these things have to be thought about consciously, not unconsciously. And that's what Swamiji is doing here, right? Again, Swamiji gives another definition of ahimsa. It's the absence of jealousy. And there's really something funny about this um, in the life of Swamiji. Uh, Sister Nivedita, his Irish disciple, so they were, uh, one time Sister Nivedita was making friends, with, I think with the, the Tagore family and some uh, elites in West Bengal society. So Swamiji did not like that, that she's mixing too much with the, she felt the uh, aristocratics of Kolkata. He said, no, you, you know, you're, you, you're going off track. So Sister Nivedita fired back at Swamiji and said, you're just jealous of, you're, je you're being jealous of me, you know, that I'm making these new friends. Then Swamiji replied, whatever defects I may have, know for certain that jealousy is not one of them. And in fact, we say you can only be jealous if you have peers. So we think who is Swamiji going to be jealous of, right? <laughs> That's another definition, absence of jealousy. Another definition we talked about from the standpoint of strength. So Swami Vivekananda says, even forgiveness, if weak and passive, is not true. Fight is better. Forgive when you can bring legions of angels to the victory. So sometimes like, this is what Arjuna was doing in the Gita, right? He saw all his relatives, Bhishma, um, Dronacharya, and he became fearful. But 
he tried to say that, no, I don't want to fight out of compassion. So I like what Swamiji says here. We first, uh, in fact, you know, when I, um, I'll give my own experience. When I joined in PPTC, uh, Bellarmont, I was, a. Uh, I was no, I just came, you know, I was just a lawyer right before that for a short time. So, you know, I, I had the, I had the uh, tendency to hit back if anybody said anything. So one of my mentors, Swami Suhitanandaji, who's a vice president now, I one day told him because it was like, so I was, I was like, even before I could catch myself, I already, already hit, my words already went back <laughs> and they were quite, you know, good responses. But anyways, I was jealous because I was seeing the other brahmacharis and they were like so calm and, you know, so composed. So I used to, I was very close to Swami Suhitanandaji and he was in charge of our PPTC at the time. So one day I told him about this. I said, you know, this is happening. So he said, they're not saying anything because they, they don't know how to react. <laughs> so first know how to give a response. And then you, you know what I'm saying? So this is what we do sometimes with these, uh, with these qualities. If we don't, we're a little bit afraid. So we also have to cultivate. So these things should be practiced from the attitude of strength, not weakness. Is that clear? Swamiji continues, uh, talking about the duties of a householder uh, in relation to Ahimsa. To his enemies, the householder must be a hero. To them, he must resist. That is the duty of the householder. He must not sit down in a corner and weep and talk nonsense about non-resistance. If he does not show himself a hero to his enemies, he has not done his duties. He has not done his duties. I should actually, he or she, we can add she, she as well, or she or he, whatever, you know. So, um, so that's one thing. So that's important. So we have always acting from this, doing your duty and doing it from a position of strength. Now you might make the objection, well, you know, sannyasins must behave without uh, hurting or uh, causing resistance to others. So I'll give the example of Swami Vivekananda. On, on a ship back from, from America to India, there was a Christian priest. He was criticizing Hinduism. He was kind of like not very big in stature. So Swamiji is a big guy, Swami Vivekananda. What does he do? Does he just sit there quietly and say nothing? No. He grabs the pre collar of the priest and he tells him, take care how you talk about my religion. Otherwise, I'll throw you overboard. Now, in this talks with Swami Vivekananda, uh, Swamiji, Swamiji or Shamba, talks with, by Sharachanda Chakraborty, he pushed back on Swamiji. He says, Swamiji, you've taken the vow of a sannyasin. How can you do that? Is it right for you to do that? Uh, why did you do that? And then Swamiji said, what would you do if somebody was criticizing your mother? Then Shara Chandra Chakrabarti said, well, then I would let him have it. Swamiji, Swamiji replied, exactly. Same thing, when somebody criticizes re your religion, you also have to uh, defend. Now, we'll, we'll talk about, we'll, any, there might be a question, so we'll, uh, afterwards we'll talk about that. Now, Holy Mother, what she said about Ramakrishna, that um, he as a husband, he never even threw a flower at her, let alone anything else. He never even threw a flower at her. In Bengali, Kokono Amar Dike Pul Chure Deni. So never even a flower. And he never used this word Thwi towards her. Does anyone, everybody understand what Thwi? Thwi Tumi Apni. In Tamil, is it is that there as well? It's it's the diminutive. It's the demean. I think the maybe diminutive would be the word. Yeah, so in French, it's yeah. too who you know so it's the kind of it's not the formal it's not the regular it's the f very familiar and somewhat okay. demeaning, I think. yes so ramakrishna thought he was talking to his his i think the maid servant or someone but holy mother walked in so Thakur, because he used this word we the whole night he couldn't even sleep he was worried about that <laughs> so you see is that level of um ahimsa yet on the other hand uh You've heard of Master Mahoshai. 
who is a uh, who compiled the gospel. He was a Vaishnav. So Vaishnavs are similar to like um, Jains, right? They have they practice this ahimsa, not to kill. So one day Ramakrishna told him to clean out his bed and to kill the bed bugs. So Master Mahasha is shaking Ramakrishna's bed. But then what does he do? He takes the bed bugs and just puts them to the side. Then Ramakrishna sees what he's doing. What did you do? I told you to kill the bed bugs. Why did, why did you not kill them? Then he follows, take care what you do. If you don't follow my instructions in these small matters, then how will you follow them in larger matters? Same thing, there is a, another uh, Vaishnav disciple of Ramakrishna. His name was Balaram Bose. He had the same yeah. tendency. Okay, let's not kill these. Let's practice ahimsa. Let's not kill these bed bugs. So one day he came to Dakshinishwar and he sees, he sees Ramakrishna just, you know, killing these bed bugs. <laughs> so what I'm saying is these things are very nuanced, right? So we have to apply what we said. What did we say Vivekananda's main name meant? Vivekananda. He who finds joy in discernment. Same thing. We also have to find joy in discernment. This is what you could say conscious living is. Let me give another example. Uh, so Ramakrishna had two disciples, Swami Yogananda and Niranjanananda. Um, Yogananda again was the Vaishnav type, very like very you know gentle. So one day he was on a boat with some other passerbys. He was going to Dakshinishwar, and one of the uh, who was it? Some of the boatmen they were talking about the Paramahamsa and they were critiquing him. So Yogananda kept very quiet. He didn't say anything. You know, he said, I'm a, you know, I won't, I, let me practice ahimsa. Let me not say anything. So he went to Ramakrishna, told him what happened. And he thought Ramakrishna would be pleased. But what did Ramakrishna reply? You did what? You didn't even, they're protesting against your guru, guru, and you didn't even say anything? You should have protested. And at the very least, left the place. This is one example. Another example, Swami Niranjanananda. He's another disciple of Ramakrishna. He's like six foot three, a really built guy. And he's like militant disposition. So he's on a similar boat going to Dakshinishwar. Again, another boat, maybe it might have been the bo same boatman, I don't know. He's criticizing Ramakrishna, <laughs> I don't know. And then he becomes so angry that he's about to turn over the boat. He said, if you say one more word, he's going to turn over the boat. Then they go to, he goes to Dakshinishwar. He tells Ramakrishna what happened. And what did Ramakrishna, you did what? Why, just for the sake of a few words, why would you, why would you cause so much harm to others? In both cases, right? Not being passive. In the case of Swami Yogananda, not being passive. In the case of Swami Niranjanananda, controlling their temper, you know? So this is, so these things are very nuanced. I'm just taking one word of ahimsa. See how Swamiji, see how Veda, Veda Vyasa talked about it, Shankaracharya, Ramanujacharya, and see how many different definitions Swami Vivekananda talked about it. See how Ramakrishna applied it. Same thing with Holy Mother. You can say she's the mother of the universe and the sweetest, kindest of all. Yes. Um, in fact, one time she was riding in a vehicle at the end of her life and it hit a dog. And she felt so bad about that, that she never again took a vehicle again. I think vehicles were just introduced at that time. So she had a gout and she would walk with that gout, but she would walk. She would never again take a vehicle again, just because of that. Anyways, uh, one day, a disciple of Ramakrishna, Harish, I think he was after Ramakrishna's passing away. Anyways, his wife gave him some type of medicine, which affected, affected his mind. He went to Kamar Prakur, he saw Holy Mother, and he starts chasing her, chasing after the Holy Mother. So Mother's running, running, and he's chasing after Mother. Finally, what does Mother do? She throws him to the ground, puts her knee on his chest, and keeps slapping him till he gets back to consciousness. So where's your, what did Gandhiji say? No, don't take on the himsa. Always take on the suffering on yourself. No, you know. This is what Swami Vivekananda is talking about. Bring the common sense approach. What you say in Vedanta, Sat Buddhi, Sat Sat Vichar. This is the Sat Sat Vichar discrimination between the real and the unreal at the practical level. <coughs> Another time even uh, when Holy Mother was in Jairambati, uh, the village women were 
forced to walk a long way. And um, Holy Mother, the British officers made them walk all the way from, I think, from uh, Kolkata to, uh, no, Jairambati to Kolkata. Then what happened then was that uh, when Holy Mother heard about this, what did she do? And did, she said, were there not any men around who could have given these British officers a few slaps? So this is what we talk, this is what, how Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda, it's very nuanced. So I just, today I just took one concept of ahimsa. You could do this with any of the, that's just one of the yamas. You could do this with any of the yamas or niyamas, anything in the scriptures. Uh, I think we're just about out of time, but I'll just close just one last one where they talk about humility. And that is uh, Gita 13.8. Amanitvam adam bhitvam ahingsa shanti rajavam. So amanitvam, it means humility. Shankara says that it means the ability uh, not to boast about oneself. Ramanujacharya said about this that it means freedom from a superior superiority complex towards eminent eminent people. Gandhi said something interesting about humility in his commentary on this uh, sloka. He said, "God, help me to tell the truth to the strong, and to avoid telling lies to to get the weak's applause." Gandhiji continues, if you give me success, do not take away my humility. And if you give me humility, do not take away my dignity. So that's really interesting. I like that. If you give me success, do not take away my humility. And if you give me humility, do not take away my dignity. Ramakrishna says something similar in the gospel, the Kothameta. He says this manhush. Manhush hush means dignity. Man means of one's own. No, hush means consciousness. And man means uh, dig, uh, yeah, dignity. So awareness of one's dignity. You must keep that awareness of dignity. Right? That's what humility Gandhiji uh, interpreted this. Now, Swami Vivekananda said, uh, in one place, to do everything to be... Actually, this happened in Cambridge. Swami Vivekananda was in Cambridge and he was meeting some people with Sarah Bull and she was like his American mother. And Swamiji was always very fiery. It's like sometimes like these people would be there, they would criticize Hinduism and Swamiji would give back. But Sarah Bull said, no, Swamiji, I just want you to be calm, dignified, be a holy man. <laughs> don't, show, don't show this temper. What does Swamiji reply to that? Do everything and be sweet. But when it comes to a horrible compromise with the truth within, then I stop. I do not believe in humility. I believe in samadarshitva, same-sightedness. Another place Swamiji says, humility is about seeing greatness in others. And let me end with this one example. Uh, this Swarachandra Chakraborty, he would come and see Swami Vivekananda in Belmont. When he would come, he would ignore Swami Vivekananda's other brother disciples. So near the near the end of Swami Vivekananda's life, he's seeing this that you know there's a big Swami, he's there, and he's ignoring his other disciples. So Swamiji tells his disciple, Sharad Chandra Chakrabarti, look here. Don't think that my other brother disciples are good for nothings. Just because they stand in my presence like shriveled flowers. In time, each of them has such spiritual power that they will be the awakening of spirituality in humanity. So this is this seeing greatness in others. Uh, and I think I'll just close with just uh, one one last um, one last my own personal reminiscence about this. How many of you here have heard about Swami Ranganathanandaji? 
Okay. So uh, when I joined, I joined Bellarmont uh, PPTC in 2004. So that was really like a spiritual boot camp, you know? You can say it was like the best of times and also the worst of times. <laughs> and you have like a 500, 600 monastic brothers living in Bellarmont. And so you, wow, that's really tough. You know, your ego is getting so crushed from all sides that, uh, wow. Uh, so anyways, what happened was that uh, I, I actually conducted the last living interview with Swami Ranganathan Ji in 2005. He passed away in in the end of April 2005 or beginning of May. And I think I conducted this interview in, in February. So I went to see him and he's in this, he's 97, 98 years old. He's sitting very straight. He's, uh, he used to read eight hours a day, even at that age. And uh, so I went to meet him. And when, when I'm meeting him, when you talk about this uh, humility and seeing greatness in others, when I was meeting him, I was thinking, Wow, he's so great, but I feel equally great. You know, it was the first time I think being in Bellarmine that you feel like, wow, I am something. You know, I'm that, I don't know what the often, but I am so you could hold your head high. Same thing, Josephine McLeod, Swami Vivekananda's disciple, had the same experience that she said she met two great people in her life. One was the Tsar of Russia, the other was Swami Vivekananda. And the Tsar of Russia, when she went to meet him, she felt that he was so great and she was so small. But when she met Swami, when she was with Swami Vivekananda, she felt that he was so great, but he, she was equally great. This is this concept of humility, right? This is this concept of ahimsa. So what I'm saying that this is what Swamiji did. He expanded these things. And this is what I'm saying that on today's, on his um, national day, that we should also try to take these things in a positive way look at them with nuance and um, apply them in our lives consciously. It's just not the highest Vedantic truth. You see that even the simple ahimsa, see how nuanced it is, but see how important it is in our life. So with that, I'd like to conclude this and any questions we can engage in that. Game a little too late. Um, Namaste Swamiji. Um, yeah. So I have gotten into uh, some, you know, heated discussions when it comes to spirituality and religion, and especially when I hear uh, a lot of uh, when Hinduism is put down, and especially by Indians. Okay. Right. And also. And then I, later on, I kind of feel, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I shouldn't have reacted. Like, I don't know. what. So what is the right thing to do? Do you, uh, I was just wondering about that. Right. So that's like very nuanced, right? That's what we see. That's what we see in the, um, in, in fact, I wrote one article on this, that even with Holy Mother, so it takes, we have to analyze that. That's where this, what we call this satasabhichar, that discernment. Right. So we have to look at that. And that's that we have to, okay, am I react? The main, what I feel the main thing, uh, the main litmus test is this Am I reacting or am I responding? This is what the Yoga Sutras talks about as well. Am I getting triggered? Right. Even to give a, an effective response, that takes nuance. That takes the Sad Buddhi. That takes this Advaita Vedanta. That takes this yoga. That takes all the self control as well, right? So I think that's the thing that we have to see. How can we engage? And at the same time, we have to see is it worth it, right? Because mm -hmm. my time, my energy is limited. We have a mm -hmm. finite amount of time and a finite amount of energy. So Holy Mother used to say like that you have this, you have one mind, one energy. Where do we want to apply it? Swamiji. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful, such beautifully nuanced talk. You know, really, we, we really don't realize in our everyday life how much uh, depth there is. 
to uh, these concepts of ahimsa and, and humility and, and so on. So first of all, thank you very much for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Just wanted to quickly ask you to, if you could elaborate on, you mentioned self, same sightedness, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't fully catch what uh, the Vivekananda quote you mentioned. Uh, could you please just re-say it and elaborate a little bit on what did he mean by same sightedness? Yeah. In the first part, he was talking about humility. I think we mentioned that, uh, you know, that there's that there's that association with that religious people should be hum hum humble, right? Mm -hmm. And what it means to be humble. So Swami Vivekananda, when he came to Cambridge, when he came to Boston, Miss Sarah Bull, she's like very dignified, you know, so she's trying to put him in the right context, the right connections. And but Swamiji is not acting like, you know, that he shows joy, he shows anger. He's he's himself, he's authentic, right? Mm -hmm. He's not gonna just put on a mask for you or I, right? Or anybody. Mm -hmm. So she's seeing this, so she's saying, No, no, you have to act dignified. And I think Swamiji replied that he said, you know, uh, this is all nice until it comes with a compromise with, with the truth. So he says, I don't believe in being sweet, meaning humble. Mm -hmm. I believe in same sightedness. The Sanskrit term is samadha shitwa, mm. same sense, seeing the divine everywhere, right? That's the litmus test of humility. That's one litmus test of humility, seeing the divine everywhere. Secondly, though, he said, seeing greatness in others. That's mm. humility. You don't have to put yourself down. I think in, as in some religions that they, they always want to put themselves down. No, you know, he said, never, you know. I will never put myself down, but I'll see the greatness in you. Right. Yeah. So it's seeing greatness in others as well as, you know, I mean, for Same better, seeing greatness in yourself or your response um, to the situation as well. Absolutely. In, in fact, they say that, um, you know, uh, we talked about this, I think, in one of our um, Buddhism, this Kalyan Mitta, this loving kindness. What does it really mean? And I think that this last day in class, we talked about it. Um, and my father brought this point. It's when this loving kindness, it it's so, so abundant within oneself that it overflows. Mm -hmm. It overflows into the other. And when I mentioned this point, I actually, it was brought up by my father. I brought it in this insight dialogue. Another person in my group, he's an astronomer at Harvard. He's talking about this Eddington theory that that's what happened with the sun. The sun became so overabundant with energy that it then exploded and, and went out. And it gave that nourishment to the entire universe. Mm. Is that what you also meant when you said self-intention um, of these, um, you know, principles? That it is, it's going to somehow uh, not benefit, but make you great in a way that that greatness overspills. And then, yeah, yeah I, I guess it's both. I, I think that's what Swamiji was hitting, hinting at. And that's one thing that Veda, Vyasa, they did not talk about, even Shankara. They sometimes only mentioned the objective element, say ahimsa, not causing harm in another. But when you look at any of these yamas or niyamas, it's both subjective as well as objective, right? right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Right, thank you. Bindu, you want to ask? Yeah. Bindu, you are muted. Did you want to ask a question? There's something in the chat here. Okay. Okay, never mind. Uh, I have a question if, uh, because I'm still not clear. Yeah. If there is, if I see the divine in everyone, yeah, um, then how would I react? Meaning, um, if I see the div divinity in everyone, then wouldn't I be more? Um, where is the anger coming from? Um, like I'm, I'm still not sure what yeah. uh, what he means by same sightedness yes seeing everybody and not seeing one person is uh, aristocratic and the other person is not i agree yeah. but if um, seeing divinity in everyone then um, i'm still not very clear 
Right. So same like you because like, wouldn't you be more polished then? Uh rather than um rather yeah, than getting that, that, a that, that's a really good point. Um I think that um you know Ramakrishna talks about this in the Kapamrita that sometimes you can't conflate polishedness with what he's talking about, which is um uh and they talk about this in Vedanta, Dvaita Vedanta as a prerequisite as well as Yoga Sutras. In Bengali, we use the word shor, shorla, shorla, S-A-R-O-L-A. That means this guilelessness, freedom of, from complexities. So I think that um, when we have that same-sidedness, it's first subjective, we have less complexities about ourselves. We can't see same-sidedness in others unless our own mind it has that purity and has that uh, less complexes, right? Mm. When you're saying where the uh, can you when like where the anger comes from? I think it comes from our own complexes, and those those complexes are, are triggering us. So how to get? It's hard to see same sidedness in others when we're getting triggered by our our own complexes. But Swamiji is an enlightened person, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to understand from his point of view. Right. Oh, okay. Why he got, okay. Yeah, but you know what? That's the great thing. See, this is what, um, there's another incident that happened, I didn't mention, that Swamiji was once on a, um, I think in Chennai, I think, and they were critiquing him because he's not a Brahmin, right? So they were calling him like a Shudra. He's a Kshatriya. So they said, you have no right to take sannyasa in South because you're only the Orthodox Brahmins can take it. So they were saying many names of him. So finally, Swamiji got fed up and he said, if I'm a Shudra, you're the Shudra of Shudras. <laughs> Afterwards, this Ashwin Kumar Dutta asked him about this. That Swamiji, was that right? You're a sannyasin and um, you said that. You reacted like, is that right? And Swamiji replied, heavens no, but what to do? I became angry, you know? No, so know. this is what you call Shorla. But okay, it's so, you know, that's not his, you know what I'm saying? That there's like that distinction. You don't have to just sit down and take everything is what you're saying. Well, you, you're just natural and you're not, uh, even Ramakrishna, so there's like this di distinction, like sometimes you see people, they don't react, they're very polished outside. That's not spirituality though, right? That's diplomacy. So that will work well in the world of the of the matter, but not the world of spirit. That's that's a great point. Diplomacy and, uh, and what you're inside, what you're inside is all that matters, right? True. Absolutely. What's inside all that mess. So we spend so much, I think Swamiji talked about that. We spend so much, uh, when he went to the West, so much time is spent on the exterior, polishing the exterior right. at the expense of the interior. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah. yeah. So Swamiji, that seems to be one of the litmus tests then. How, what is the internal state? Yes. After, you know, we might have uh, given an angry response or or whatever. Uh, what is that inner state? Are we able to bring it back to the center? you know, as quickly as possible or, you know, ask for forgiveness from the other as well as forgive yourself to again make this the inner state be as clean as possible, as quickly as possible. And that's an excellent point. And just to add to that, it's not like uh, we, our goal is progress, right? So as long as we have these three gunas, we're going to react. It's just a question of, I'm not competing with anybody else. Okay, maybe yesterday I got triggered with my brother. How long did it take for me to come back? Yeah. And how long, moreover, how soon after did I realize I got triggered? Mm -hmm. Is that that's not so easy? How how soon after did I realize, okay, I, I became triggered? Because when we were triggered, we're unconscious at that time, right? Mm -hmm. How soon after did so the moment the more we can cut that time down, that's progress. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Practical tips you can give us today um, as, uh, you know, novices, what we can, other than our sadhana, are there, are there any other practical tips so to practice ahimsa? Oh, ahimsa. Um, Nonviolence in words and thoughts. Right. right. Nonviolence. I, yeah, I think that, um, yeah, um, well, I think that. I think the first thing is that having not ahimsa towards ourselves too, feeling good about ourselves, finding the good point, you know, I think that's really important. And that's what we talk about in the Yoga Sutras that, uh, you know, that 
there's good points of view. So bringing those out more. Uh, and engaging in more activities that bring out those points and qualities qualities as well. Uh, there's one, well, one person had cancer. I heard this Winfred Gallagher. She wrote that book, Wrapped. And she, she mentioned that she was feeling bad about herself, beating herself up. But at some point, she just made a decision. No, I'm going to live my life. So what she wanted to do, and uh, she started writing, she started engaging her, that same mind that was in, we only have one mind. I think this is what Holy Mother said. So engaging that mind in something positive, something that I already have within myself, so I don't have to build much momentum about it either. Yeah, and I think the second thing is that, you know, that if we can kind of, in Harvard, we use this word, lean into it. Difficult situations rather than feeling, oh no, if we can kind of lean into it with anticipation and curiosity and a sense of excitement, you know? Okay, so this is there. So how can we, how can we get through it? Every moment, every challenge is like a, an opportunity for transformation. I think Bindu has a question, but uh, for some reason we are not able to unmute her. Uh, Bindu, if you could maybe type your question in the chat. Thank you. Are you, you pretty much you have a good group here, huh? You have a you have a <laughs> very good. You're doing something good. Good. You guys have this mind gym. That's a great thing to do. That's something positive too, right? Doing something, trying to benefit society, trying to benefit yourself. So I think Swamiji would have liked these types of activities. Not only thinking about yourself, thinking about society not just being a mute spectator. So you, you, you're you doing something like this. So you're not getting involved in all these different movements. You're doing your own, creating a, ni a nice space, a nice positive space and trying to expand it. So that's a good thing, I feel. Yeah. Oh, uh, Bindu has a, um, okay. Anyone else has any questions till then? Bindu types. I have a quick question. Sorry, I should have raised my hand. And But if Bindu comes in, I, I, I want to make sure I'm not taking your space. You're at Harvard now. Do you find it, do you find any perceptions of Hinduism to be problematic there? How do you navigate that space? On the one hand, you're a student there, and mm -hmm. right? But on the other mm -hmm. hand, you bring your own expertise. How do, how do you, how do you navigate that space? Given all that you've given, given all that you've um, shared with us, I'm curious, how you yourself are able to navigate that space where it's, you know, I'm, yeah, that's, most that's of us like locals a, are aware of the problem, you know, some of the problematic narratives of Hinduism at Harvard. So, yeah, that's an excellent question. So like um, what happened, like I think at the beginning of last semester, this um, there's um, another uh, Buddhist ministry student. His name is Santosh. He's from Hyderabad. He converted from uh, Hinduism to Buddhism because of casteism, caste discrimination. So then what happened was that uh, he was giving a presentation and he invited some scholar, a scholarly panel there. And so we went there to support Santosh. Then what he did is he's showing this video on this Dr. Ambedkar, who uh, converted like I think 200,000 uh, Hindus to Buddhas. So he's showing this video and then he shows Dr. Ambedkar like saying this, for once and for all, we're giving up this despicable religion, right? So coincidentally, at that time, then, then they convened a panel. And co coincidentally, at that time, uh, me and the other Swami, we had to leave because we, we were going to attend a concert in Boston. So everyone thought we were leaving because of that. We were not leaving because of that. because But anyways, everyone thought that. So the next day, people, uh, scholars, Buddhist scholars, and my friends and students, they were asking me what, what you thought about it. So I said that... Uh, Yes, which is true. It might be true. Yes, it's true. There's some caste, caste problems in Hinduism, absolutely. But then I also replied that, um, but you're not, conf see, you're doing that here, but you're not conflating uh, Christianity with the Crusades, G Islam with the Jihad, 
in Buddhism, so much violence is there in Sri Lanka and those places. And so you're not doing that. So it seems a little bit unfair, you know, if you want to just stigmatize one, but not the others, that, that seems a little bit. Unfair. So you just say like that and people, they really agree. They were, they, so you just, you know, you give a thoughtful, that's, they really appreciate the response. And later on the Santosh actually, I actually took him to Purnima's house. She invited us, I think the day before Thanksgiving. So I took him there. So um, we had dinner there. When we returned, he said that um, his whole idea about Vedanta and Hinduism changed, you know. So if you meet some broad-minded people in other traditions who are empathetic, that also causes change in others as well, you know. So I think both aspects have to be there. Logic, not getting emotional, uh, just like we said, not reacting but responding. And secondly, that... Uh, you know, yeah, leaning in, leaning in with curiosity, leaning in and seeing them as human beings as well, you know, hearing their story, hearing their narrative. Like I asked Santos, what happened? So he told me what happened. So, okay, I can see that. I can see why he's angry. You know? so. Yeah, I, I I was particularly interested in your um response because I know, similar to me, you grew up here and I think, you know, it's one thing when you come affirmed from another country in your own identity. But I think for our young people, for students, for kids in school, it, be, you know, when, when distorted narratives are in place, it can be very problematic. So I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing your measured response. And I think that's something that we can share with even our young people. So they feel empowered. Thank you. Yeah. For now. Thank, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. That's uh, someone has their hand. Raised. Namaste, Swamiji. Namaste. I have a question um, in regards to science and spirituality. I bridge the gap at a lot of places, companies, corporate culture events, um, with insurance companies at some point. I want to know what are some practical tips that you may have that we can bridge this gap with? Between science and spirituality? Yeah. How did you bridge the gap? So scientists, scientists see this, they are into the science world a lot. They on, they're only seeing the outside, right? And spirituality is connecting with the spirit. Mm -hmm. But outside is just a reflection of what it is inside. And how uh, how should the conversations be with scientists or people in academia where they are not seeing inside right any uh, thoughts on that no no but how did you do it though i, I was just asking how did you how do, do i do it yeah so uh for me it's i touch base on any fears that people have and our habits that we have karmic repeated habits Okay. And which we have inside, and once we tap into it, we slowly work on it. And once they go away, uh, outside is no more a manifestation of it. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. So I've no, been talking. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. No, Sorry. it's it's tough because I I attended a um a conversation between at Harvard between Sadhguru and Steven Pinker, and mm. so like two different planets, you know. And I think I also even saw Sarva Priyananda with uh. Who is it? Not Richard Dawkins. The um, forgot some atheist. So it's like Sam, two different Sam Harris. Yeah, yeah. Sam. Who's yeah? Sam Harris. Yeah. So it's like you know he's giving his speech. He's giving his spiel. So it's like you know it's uh that's not easy. So that's why I was asking how you did it. Maybe you know I don't know, but maybe you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thought you may have some practical no, ideas. No, but I, I would say that I would say though that I was just going in rather than when people have like differing opinions, what can I learn from them though, right? Mm. Um, I, I appreciate that some of our monks, they want to investigate in science and they have an open mindset, right? Mm. So how can I learn and how can I keep my own biases aside? What can I learn? What are they saying? You know, that's, I think that that's important. Mm. And that, that's what I would say that what, uh, I don't know about trying to change others unless, you know, they want to be changed. <laughs> Mm. The thing is, if they don't know that there is a transform, it can be transformed, then they don't want to change. Right. That That's true. That's true. But how to bring that about without being like kind of, yeah, sure. 
that that's, that's how to bring that awareness i think yeah yeah i think that's i think that's your cup you know swamiji said everyone has their own cup i think that's your cup <laughs> that's my cup okay yeah. <laughs> yeah, let, good let to us... see you again thank yeah, you good to see you thank you, thank you. so okay. maharaj bindu has uh, typed the question okay it says when i have difficulty in convincing or seeing eye to eye i often go on with the shloka from isha upanishad which satisfies me and i can move on in Swamiji's wow. view, how would you put it? Oh, I think that's great. You know, it's, that's that works for her. You know, I think that's wonderful that she found something that works for her. So that's great. You know, I think everyone has something that appeals to them. So I think that that's uh, that's great. You know, um, yeah. I think when I was I practiced law for a short time, so I used to I had like that small book, Thus Spake Vivekananda. So when I used to go into court, I used to put that book in my pocket and I would like look at that, <laughs> get myself pumped up beforehand. <laughs> so I I like those things. I like these affirmations, these thus spake books by Swamiji. Those things, I find that those are really nice. I like those things very much. Um, they, uh, yeah. So I think it's all about trying to, you know, I've sometimes seen some monks, they always have a positive mindset. I, met a couple of monks in my life they also have a very positive mindset all the time so just one thing i'll add is that they're very consistent in their routine that's one thing i see with positive people and, and so that they do the same thing as as far as possible things are regulated then what happens is that they can apply their energy their energy they're living a regulated life they're getting up at the same time they're going to sleep at the same time they're even having their meals almost at the same time and then what happens is that they get this excess amount of energy and they, they can put that towards creative activities. So, let me see. Okay. Okay, so it's very nice, nice meeting all of you. So thank you so much. And uh, This is a wonderful session, Samiji. Yeah. Thank you for thank you. Thank joining you. us here. Okay. We appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll just close with the chant then. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Panamastri